Imagine you're some anatomist in the 1800s wanting to know the structure of the brain and the spinal cord. What techniques do you have at your disposal? You could easily get a brain perhaps from an executed criminal fresh from the gallows or an animal. You could then have a look at the brain's superficial characteristics. Perhaps if you're really good, you'll do a careful dissection and note those long fibers running through the white matter connecting different parts of the brain. You and your fellow anatomists will assign various Latin names to the grooves and the bumps that will drive medical students nuts for centuries to come. But suppose you ask what the brain is made of beneath the level of superficial appearances. Even the microscope won't be very useful. The brain is way too complex and there's too much going on to be revealed by simply placing a morsel of dog brain on a glass slide. It wasn't until the discovery of staining techniques, especially by the Italian pathologist Camillo Golgi, that would allow the anatomist to see individual cells in the brain and their structure. The reazione nera, or black reaction in English, was Golgi's innovation, which excludes most of the complexity of a brain sample, leaving only a few neurons stained in their entirety in black. This staining technique is so good that we still use it today to look at the ultra structure of a neuron. The black reaction allows one to see cells within the brain, but the larger task remains of understanding what one is seeing. Golgi had used his black reaction to great success, looking at different parts of the brain, meticulously writing and sketching what he was seeing under the microscope. The Spanish pathologist Santiago Ramon y Cajal was also impressed by the black reaction and soon set his sights to using it to understand the brain's microscopic anatomy. Being an excellent artist besides a great anatomist, he was able to produce sketches of numerous regions of the brain, which are still considered to be more or less accurate. They're certainly better than any dumb cartoon you'll likely see in a biology textbook. We recognize Cajal as one of the great neuroscientists from his defense and refinement of the neuron doctrine, the idea that the brain is made of individual cells called neurons, which communicate with each other by almost touching, but not quite. These locations where neurons almost touch one another would later be called synapses. Golgi, on the other hand, thought that the brain was made of a continuous mesh of nerve, where cells flow right into each other, and they communicate through this common internal cellular fluid. This was called the reticular theory, reticulum just being a fancy Latin word for mesh. Like all great controversies, people line up on both sides to tell the other side why they're idiots. However, a more detailed look at the microscopic evidence and further innovations in imaging would show Cajal to be right and Golgi to be wrong. Neurons don't form Golgi's continuous mesh, but are instead the discrete units of the brain that communicate through small synaptic gaps. Interestingly, Golgi's early sketches of his brain specimens never actually showed the neurons forming a mesh, which means he was observing more or less the same thing as Cajal. We should now ask why Golgi so tenuously held to his reticular theory. Perhaps in the controversy, he and those defending his theory, the so-called reticularists, got too wrapped up in the ponage. People don't change all that much, do they? Anyway, the way Cajal conceptualized the neuron and the insights this neuron doctrine model gives us in understanding how the brain works is why we now know Cajal is one of the founding fathers of neuroscience. Besides being a great artist and a scientist, Cajal was also a great writer, and I would also claim a great philosopher, even though he has nothing but bad things to say about speculative philosophizing, as you'll surely see in this reading. What I'd now like to read is the first chapter of Cajal's Reglas y Consejos sobre la Investigación Científica, which I translate as Rules and Advice for Scientific Research. But I guess it actually gets translated as advice for the young investigator. Nonetheless, Cajal does indeed provide some tips for the young researcher and his paternal advice on how to approach and how not to approach scientific questions. As you'll see, he's great fun to read, even if you disagree. Think of Nietzsche, plus the lifetime of experience as a researcher, plus philosophy of science. I shall assume that the reader's general education and background in philosophy are sufficient to understand that the major sources of knowledge include observation, experiment, and reasoning by induction and deduction. Instead of elaborating on accepted principles, let us simply point out that for the last hundred years, the natural sciences have abandoned completely the Aristotelian principles of intuition, inspiration, and dogmatism. The unique method of reflection indulged in by the Pythagoreans and followers of Plato, and pursued in modern times by Descartes, Fichte, Krauss, Hegel, and more recently, at least partly by Bergson, involves exploring one's own mind or soul to discover universal laws and solutions to the great secrets of life. Today, this approach can only generate feelings of sorrow and compassion, the latter because of talent wasted in the pursuit of chimeras, and the former because of all the time and work so pitifully squandered. The history of civilization proves beyond doubt just how sterile the repeated attempts of metaphysics to guess at nature's laws have been. Instead, there is every reason to believe that when the human intellect ignores reality 
and concentrates within, it can no longer explain the simplest inner workings of life's machinery, or of the world around us. The intellect is presented with phenomena marching in review before the sensory organs. It can be truly useful and productive only when limiting itself to the modest tasks of observation, description, and comparison, and of classification that is based on analogies and differences. A knowledge of underlying causes and empirical laws will then come slowly through the use of inductive methods. Another commonplace worth repeating is that science cannot hope to solve ultimate causes. In other words, science can never understand the foundation hidden below the appearance of phenomena in the universe. As Claude Bernard has pointed out, researchers cannot transcend the determinism of phenomena. Instead, their mission is limited to demonstrating the how, never the why, of observed changes. This is a modest goal in the eyes of philosophy, yet an imposing challenge in actual practice. Knowing the conditions under which a phenomenon occurs allows us to reproduce or eliminate it at will, therefore allowing us to control and use it for the benefit of humanity. Foresight and action are the advantages we obtain from a deterministic view of phenomena. The severe constraints imposed by determinism may appear to limit philosophy in a rather arbitrary way. However, there is no denying that in the natural sciences, and especially in biology, it is a very effective tool for avoiding the innate tendency to explain the universe as a whole in terms of general laws. They are like a germ with all the necessary parts just as a seed contains all the potentialities of the future tree within it. Now and then philosophers invade the field of biological sciences with these beguiling generalizations which tend to be unproductive, purely verbal solutions lacking in substance. At best, they may prove useful when viewed simply as working hypotheses. Thus, we are forced to concede that the great enigmas of the universe listed by Dubois Raymond are beyond our understanding at the present time. The great German physiologist pointed out that we must resign ourselves to the state of we do not know, or even the inexorable we shall not know. There is no doubt that the human mind is fundamentally incapable of solving these fundamental problems. The origin of life, nature of matter, origin of movement, and appearance of consciousness. Our brain is an organ of action that is directed toward practical tasks. It does not appear to have been built for discovering the ultimate causes of things, but rather for determining their immediate causes and invariant relationships. And whereas this may appear to be very little, it is in fact a great deal. Having been granted the immense advantage of participating in the unfolding of our world and of modifying it to life's advantage, we may proceed quite nicely without knowing the essence of things. It would not be wise in discussing general principles of research to overlook those panaceas of scientific method, so highly recommended by Claude Bernard, which are to be found in Bacon's Novum Organum and Descartes' Book of Methods. They are exceptionally good at stimulating thought, but are much less effective in teaching one how to discover. After confessing that reading them may suggest a fruitful idea or two, I must further confess an inclination to share the maestro's view of Novum Organum. Those who have made the greatest discoveries in science never read it, and Bacon himself failed to make a single discovery based upon his own rules. Liebig appears even more harsh in his celebrated academic discourse when he states that Bacon was a scientific dilettante whose writings contained nothing of the processes leading to discovery, regardless of inflated praise from jurists, historians, and others far removed from science. No one fails to use instinctively the following general principles of Descartes when approaching any difficult problem. Quote, Do not acknowledge as true anything that is not obvious, divide a problem into as many parts as necessary to attack it in the best way, and start an analysis by examining the simplest and most easily understood parts before ascending gradually to an understanding of the most complex." Unquote. The merit of the French philosopher is not based on his application of these principles, but rather on having formulated them clearly and rigorously after having profited by them unconsciously, like everyone else in his thinking about philosophy and geometry. I believe that the slight advantage gained from reading such work and in general any work concerned with philosophical methods of investigation, is based on the vague general nature of the rules they express. In other words, when they are not simply empty formulas, they become formal expressions of the mechanism of understanding used during the process of research. This mechanism acts unconsciously in every well-organized and cultivated mind, and when the philosopher reflexively formulates psychological principles, neither the author nor the reader can improve their respective abilities for scientific investigation. Those writing on logical methods impress me in the same way as what a speaker attempting to improve his eloquence by learning about brain speech centers, about voice mechanics, and about the distribution of nerves to the larynx, as if knowing these anatomical and physiological details would create organization where none exists, or refine what we already have. It is important to note 
that the most brilliant discoveries have not relied on a formal knowledge of logic. Instead, their discoverers have had an acute inner logic that generates ideas with the same unstudied unconsciousness that allowed Jourdain to create prose. Reading the work of the great scientific pioneers such as Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Lavoisier, Geoffrey St. Hilaire, Faraday, Ampere, Bernard, Pasteur, Virchow, and Liebig is considerably more effective. However, it is important to realize that if we lack even a spark of the splendid light that shone in these minds, and at least a trace of the noble zeal that motivated such distinguished individuals, this exercise may, if nothing else, convert us to enthusiastic or insightful commentators on their work, perhaps even to good scientific writers, but it will not create the spirit of investigation within us. A knowledge of principles governing the historical unfolding of science also provides no great advantage in understanding the process of research. Herbert Spencer proposed that intellectual progress emerges from that which is homogeneous and that which is heterogeneous, and by virtue of the instability of that which is homogeneous and of the principle that every cause produces more than one effect, each discovery immediately stimulates many other discoveries. However, even if this concept allows us to appreciate the historical march of science, it cannot provide us with the key to its revelations. The important thing is to discover how each investigator, in his own special domain, was able to segregate heterogeneous from homogeneous, and to learn why many of those who set out to accomplish a particular goal did not succeed. Let me assert without further ado that there are no rules of logic for making discoveries, let alone for converting those lacking a natural talent for thinking logically into successful researchers. As for geniuses, it is well known that they have difficulty bowing to rules. They prefer to make them instead. Condorcet has noted that the mediocre can be educated, the geniuses educate themselves. Must we therefore abandon any attempt to instruct and educate about the process of scientific research? Shall we leave the beginner to his own devices, confused and abandoned, struggling with guidance or advice along a path strewn with difficulties and dangers? Definitely not. In fact, just the opposite. We believe that by abandoning the ethereal realm of philosophical principles and abstract methods, we can descend to the solid ground of experimental science, as well to the sphere of ethical considerations involved in the process of inquiry. In taking this course, simple, genuinely useful advice for the novice can be found. In my view, some advice about what should be known, about what technical education should be acquired, about the intense motivation needed to succeed, and about the carelessness and inclination toward bias that must be avoided, is far more useful than all the rules and warnings of theoretical logic. This is the justification for the present work, which contains those encouraging words and paternal admonitions that the writer would have liked so much to receive at the beginning of his own modest scientific career. My remarks will not be of much value to those having had the good fortune to receive an education in the laboratory of a distinguished scientist under the beneficial influence of living rules embodied in a learned personality who was inspired by the noble vocation of science combined with teaching. They will also be of little use to those energetic individuals, those gifted souls mentioned above, who obviously need only the guidance provided by study and reflection to gain an understanding of the truth. Nevertheless, it is perhaps worth repeating that they may prove comforting and useful to the large number of modest individuals with a retiring nature who, despite yearning for reputation, have not yet reaped the desired harvest due either to a certain lack of determination or to misdirected efforts. This advice is aimed more at the spirit than the intellect, because I am convinced, and Payat wisely agrees, that the former is as amenable to the education as the latter. Furthermore, I believe that all outstanding work in art as well as in science results from immense zeal applied to a great idea.